Rose Show. This Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Bringing you entertaining and inspiring guests. This is episode number 16 with the presenter of the Man Up TV series, Gus Warland. Trying to stick up to those old fashioned rules on what it is to be a man is killing us. We're losing eight young Australian men every single day. 24,000, uh, 2,400 a year, and it's a national disgrace. And if we had that amount of people getting killed on the roads, they'd ban cars. On the outside, he has a gregarious and rambunctious nature. It goes hand in hand with his role as the head of one of the most successful Australian drive time radio shows. From the outside, it all looks perfect. Great job, family, prospects, and an outlook in life which is thankful. But sadly, Gussie's life was turned upside down when his friend Angus took his own life. The number one way for an Aussie male to die between the ages of 15 to 44 is to commit suicide. 2,400 males per annum take their own life. Gus made a three-part programme to save the life of Australian men, to find out what is the cause of this growing crisis and to end the silence about male suicide. I've watched this three-part programme and I implore you to do the same because it's not just Australia, it's global, it's growing and it has to stop. Please listen to this show from beginning to end. Not for me, but for your future and those that surround you. There's no easy way to talk about today's subject matter, but it's something that we all have to do because at the moment our ignorance and lack of understanding is causing men to take their own life. Suicide. Even saying the word sounds like you're doing something bad. But the more we talk about it, the more lives we can save. This episode is not all doom and gloom. We have some laughs, we do. And we talk about the issues that surround this problem. But for now, enjoy the show. Gus, in your own words, uh, can you describe the Man Up programme for us? Yeah, sure. I think it ended up being something different to what we first thought, to be honest. It started off, it was funded by... Movember, who are, I know they're big in the UK as well, but they're massive here for, for mainly, um, you know, men's cancers, if you like. Um, get, you know, get yourself um, checked all the time up the jacksy and all that jazz. Sure. So everyone was thinking, okay, we've got to do something around that and men. And then Melbourne University came in with some money and said, we wouldn't mind doing a case study about masculinity and what it takes to be an Aussie man. I think around the world, and certainly in Australia, we've got this impression that if you're an Aussie bloke, then you're tough, you can handle anything, you know, we wrestle sharks, you know, we're with the manliest men of, around, which the which is just not the truth, it's not the reality, and in fact, it's killing us, that type of attitude, that steeliness, that stoicness that was so strong in building the country that we are, because we're a very young country compared to you guys, um, just over 200 years, but we had to have stoic, brilliant, tough men and women um, to make Australia. We don't need to be that tough anymore. Like, we all live down the eastern seaboard. We're a very sophisticated country. Trying to stick up to those old-fashioned rules on what it is to be a man is killing us. We're losing eight young Australian men every single day, 24,000, uh, 2,400 a year, and it's a national disgrace. And if we had that amount of people getting killed on the roads, they'd ban cars. But no one seems to really, outside of the bubble that is mental health, wants to talk about suicide. We whisper it around the water cooler every morning. So we wanted to come up with a show that was entertaining that was going to start a conversation about what does it take to be an Aussie man and if it is at the moment killing us, what are we going to do to change that? So we we had three hours to do it. We shot for 61 days. So if you've been in the industry long enough to know 61 days for three hours is a lot. Yep. So we went down a lot of rabbit holes that didn't quite work out. There was a lot of storylines that we thought were going to work, and they didn't. Fortunately, we had a good budget. But even that, we spent the last 10 days, everyone, getting paid nothing because we were all so invested in the show, we wanted to be a part of it. So that's what Man Up is in a nutshell, and um, I'm very proud of it. You know, I'm glad that you're here and that you watched it, and the fact that you were able to watch it in Scotland was amazing because we gave it away to the manup.org website. We... I. Um, ABC iView is free as well around the world. We took away all the geographic sort of licenses so that could happen. 
Um, because by the sounds of it, it's a problem everywhere in the world. Yeah, generally when I have a guest on, I'll try not to reference too much of something they've not seen or something they've not known. But I want to make a point of referencing a lot of the show today. And the reason is that I want the listeners of the podcast show to go, I've, I can't quite understand what he's talking about because I think everyone should watch the show. Uh, it's entertaining, it's informative, and it, it holds a very good balance in between talking about what is a dark subject. Yeah. And even me saying it's a dark subject, you know, goes back to the, you know, the sort of taboo, which we'll, which we'll go into later on. But for all the listeners, feel free to pause my show right now <laughs> and go and spend three hours. And it might not be three hours that will necessarily save your life, but it may well be three hours that will save somebody that you know, or will help you understand or start a, start a subject. Going into the programme, you know, pre-production, what reservations did you have about making this programme? Well, the most important thing for me was when I was asked to do it, because they had a list of people that wanted to host it. Someone had seen me do a keynote speaking role about my friend Angus, who um, was the gentleman who passed away. Um, see, there you go. That's See, I'm doing exactly the same thing. He killed himself. He suicided. Um, it took me a long time to get my head around that. And I wanted to make sure that if they chose me to do it, that I was able to give 100%. So I went and spoke to his wife. I went and spoke to his children, who I'm great mates with. But we're mates like Australians are with mates because we catch up at barbecues. We go to sporting events together, just like you guys in Scotland. I've never breached the fact that their father has killed themselves with them. We've never had that discussion. Yeah. Except when it first happened, I said, I'm here for you. I love you. I, I travelled back from the UK to be there for the wedding, uh, for the funeral. So they knew that I cared. But I said, I will not do this show unless you allow me to do it because it's obviously going to bring a bit of, you know, memories back for them. Plus also, I'd love you in it if you want to have your point of view, if you want to try to help. So all that had to be sort of measured away and they all gave a big tick. So all, because nine years had passed. So everyone had got their heads around, everyone got a little bit older. Everyone understood a little bit more and done their own investigation into how they felt. matured with the concept. Correct. And they had also started to do fun runs, uh, climbing mountains, all for charity, all for Lifeline, one of our charities here, um, which we decided to sort of put, um, you know, at the top of the charity that we as a family would put money towards. And I'm now a counsellor with them. So... Once I had that all in line, I just said to my wife, there's going to be some moments and my kids that I'm going to come home and I'm not very good at getting information that I have that's a little bit sad and dark and getting rid of it. I tend to hold on to it too much. So I said, I'm going to need a little bit of time where I'm not exactly, you know, the best husband in the world, the best father in the world, but I think I'm going to be doing something quite special that in the end you'll be proud of me. And uh, so once I got the ticks from the family, then... I then hope I got the gig, and you know, when I got the gig, it was okay. Big deep breath. Let's go and do it, and do it right. But you, d- you done it, and it was respectful. And you know, I've you know, obviously listened to you, and there's a persona of Gus, but it's pretty much the same in real life. You're amiable, and you're gregarious, and you know, you like to have a laugh. But you managed to find that balance in between, you know, when you had to be sensitive. Yeah. But at the same time, you, you have to talk about it. What feedback have you had personally and what feedback have you had perhaps professionally since you made the programme? Um, you're right, it was a fine line between, um, I was going to start singing pleasure and pain, but it is a little bit pleasure and pain, but it's a fine line between making an, international, uh, an entertaining programme but also making sure that we respected the subject matter. Um, because no one wants to sit down and watch a show about suicide that's all doom and gloom for three hours that would have been a waste of everyone's time and money. So we needed to have a little bit of light and shade all the way through it, which is why we had the, the nude yoga and we had other really sort of fun little moments where Aussies, I think, are a bit similar to the Scots. You know, if there's something to really discuss sensibly, we tend to make a joke about it. Yep. And we tend to have a few beers with it and we tend to, you know, try to make disarm it... Disarm it. Yeah, disarm it, exactly. Um, so for me personally, I've always... Uh, the TV shows I've done in the past are all about travel, watching the Australian cricket team, fun, enjoyable, mucking around, taking the piss. Yeah. Um, this obviously was very different to that. So people have seen me in a much different light now. And um, it's actually, for me, I'm now looking at, episode, at series two, 
It's going to be called Man Child, and it's going to be all about the rites of passage of kids around the world and how they cope going from a child to a to a from a boy to a man. Um, I'm now in the mix for all those type of roles. I'm in the mix for those type of discussions. I'm not just the clown doing fart jokes on the radio, mucking around, eating the holly, the hottest chili in India. Oh. I'm actually now allowed to actually play with the adults. And um, I've now made it my life's work to make sure that I've, um, I'm doing all I can, charity-wise, to make as much money to get training into schools so we can stop this epidemic that's happening in Australia. But the whole thing of, you know, man up and, you know, you touched on the thing with, with, with the children and the younger ones, it's amazing how early, as a child, if, if you start crying because you've fallen down, you know, or stand up, be a man, or yeah. I grew up, I had an experience of a parent passing when I was really young. Sorry. And it was, yeah, you know, it, it was that thing of, oh, you need, you need to grow up and you need to deal with this. You're the man of the house now, or you're the this or the that. Yeah, or like, you know, you need to pull your weight, and that is that is no reflection on my family, That I think that's a universal thing. Absolutely. And then you're like, well, at what point, or at what time are you going to like actually sit down and deal with that stuff? And that, for me, is, you know, a parent dying, but for somebody else that might be their parent losing their job and having to move to a smaller house, it might be a difficulty of moving to another school, it might be a difficulty of failing to cope with exam stress. Of course. And I think that, as your man in the programme said, you know, this is a pressure cooker, and unless you let that off at one point, yeah. then it's just going to explode. Exactly. That's the problem we have in Australia, is that we've got this attitude of, she'll be right, mate, leave it to me, I don't want to ask for any help or support, and the pressure just builds, and we just keep chucking all the toxic crap down in our tummy, and eventually you're going to get sick. And, of course, once you get sick, you're not thinking clearly, and that's when you make decisions or start down a path that, in the end, you think makes total sense. Um, but, of course, you know, when, when you're outside of that bubble looking in, you're going, you know, this person's in crisis. Well, I think that's when emotional crutches, whether it be gambling, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol, and that, of course, spills into, you know, domestic abuse. Another stuff, and it just becomes a cycle that goes round. During the program, what was the biggest? What was your biggest learning about the male suicide epidemic? Well, firstly, the first thing they told me, which was in Australia, if you're aged between fifteen and forty-five as an Aussie man, the number one way of losing your life is suicide. That took me a month to get my head around, and I didn't believe them initially either. I went and checked it, and checked it, and checked it, and realised now that that's the case. When we started doing Man Up, it was like six point eight. Aussie men were killing themselves every day. Now it's eight. If you look around and you Google, do a Google search, or you go and ask anyone, there are a million people there willing to give you ideas, thoughts, positive, creative, beautiful people. But for some reason, the numbers keeps going up. So for me, that initial thought was the one that went, oh, okay, well, this is much bigger than I ever thought it was going to be. So my initial reaction was the biggest thing I ever got. Then, of course, you get down to business and you start realising how many awesome people are out there trying to help. And then you talk, go and talk to people about um, the fact there's not enough government funding, you know. For the amount of people that die, we have 10% of the road budget, for instance. You know, 300 die on the roads in Australia a year, 3,000 are suicide, but the money's 100 million to 10 million. Like, hello? So you go talk to the health minister, chat to her, then she gets sacked for doing something wrong. So now I'm talking to the new health minister who's, of course, you know, happy to help and whatever, but they're tied by crap that we have here in Australia. I'm assuming we have the same crap of in course. Scotland. Good people can't make good decisions once they get into power because they're, you know, for whatever reason, they haven't quite, you know, compromised enough to be able to get that to happen. So we just go around in this awful circle. Again, it's, it's that taboo that nobody really wants to put their name to, whether it be a political thing. But no one wants to like be identified with oh that's the suicide guy yeah you know which is practice because be the suicide guy yeah yeah because the reality is at the, at the end of the program it's like you know it's your brother it's your sister it's you know your aunt it's your uncle you know everyone's been touched yeah, by it now you know if you were if you were to go into office next door and say everyone raise their hands who's been affected by cancer people would quite proudly go yes but if you go well who's been affected by suicide then people are, I don't think people would be quite as, as... Well, they wouldn't in this office because 
we film so much of Man Up in and around here, and we have really good systems set up. But that's only in the last eighteen months. Yeah. Before that, you're definitely you're right. It would have been sheepishly looking at maybe the odd person with that character that goes, I don't mind showing it. Yeah. I'm but a lot of people would come up to you afterwards and say, Hey, you know, it happened to my my mate or my whatever it might be. Um, it's still such a stigma surrounded by it, no matter how much we try to talk about it out in the open. You know, we still got a problem with it. One of the parts in the program that really rang to me was when you went to the GQ office and you were uh, you were dressed up in a number of outfits and there was <laughs> one that I believe you were actually shot walking down the street and you have what looks like a girl's dress and a hat. Now, if you and I talk about it and then, you know, somebody else talks about it, you thinking about wearing the outfit, the reality is that all it takes is for one person to wear the outfit and then it kind of seems okay. Mm. Since making the program... Uh, your, you know, your saxa mates, you know, that you go, <laughs> yeah. you go and have the fun. Has it changed the, the dynamic of the conversation since you've made that program? We've, we've always, the, the saxa mates, me, me and my three sort of besties, um, we've always been very different to a lot of bloke groups. Like, we love talking about sport, we love having a crack, we love having a few beers, a bit of a carry on at times, but we've always been very good. We've known each other 40 years of being able to, pick something that's not quite right or say, mate, you're not 100% on song. Um, but we're even deeper now because of the man up experience because, I don't know, we'd, I think I reckon if you build a safe environment, most bunch of mates will can go to those areas. The problem, we don't build that safe environment enough. We go and meet our mates at the pub, got the game on. There's a game on before the game that you actually want to watch. There's a game on after the game you want to watch. So that means you probably have half a dozen pints and then you think, one, someone, one has to go early, three blokes go off, have a couple of kebabs. So that's a great night with your mates. Of course it is. The problem is there's been no conversation of any healthy value in that, except the fact that you've had brilliant time with your mates, which is worth a lot. It's been V8 but, or V6 or who scored the try. Or, correct. Know, who yeah. scored the goal or what, a, what an idiot the referee was, whatever it might be. So with, that's absolutely perfect. And that's where I live 90% of the time. But you've got to have the vehicle to have that 10% of the time chat with someone at some stage, pull one of your mates across and say, it's not the right time now because we're all having a crack with the boys, but can I see you Wednesday night? You know, can we meet after work? I've got to talk to you about something really important. And that friend realising at that point, it's not time to take the piss. It's not the time to look your mate and go, hey, look at what Tommy just told. He wants to catch up for a DM on Wednesday because it just ruins everything. Just take that moment to meet him on Wednesday and then be a good listener. Because that's half the point. A lot of blokes do want to have a chat, but their mates take the piss and don't listen properly. So they only try it once. They don't keep going back because they feel humiliated. You, you kind of have to be very brave to go and say to one of your mates, like, I have this. Yeah. The reality is that if I was to limp in here just now and, you know, oh, what's happened, that's an old boxing injury, then that's something to can talk about. But if I walk down here and my head's all down and my speech is slow and there's no eye contact, the majority of people won't go, are you all right? And or they might ask you and you go, I'm fine, and they don't ask the next question. Saying I'm fine is the first lie that everyone says most days. Go, I'm fine, because you don't want to burden people with your shit. I understand that. I do that myself. I did it myself for a long time. And I don't walk in like Ben behind you there. We're, we're sitting in an office with glass. We're looking out on a radio station that's busily working its way through the Sydney morning. If Ben came up to me and said, are you okay, Gus? I'd say I'm fine because I don't want to talk to Ben. Because Ben's not my mate. He's someone I work with. He's a good bloke, but he's younger and I don't want to talk to him. I might say to one of the blokes I really respect and love, mate, I'm not 100%. I'll get through today, but I really need you to help me out after the show. I would be able to do that. I don't think many people can. For whatever reason, most Aussie blokes just don't feel comfortable doing that. Do you think men are aware of the help that is actually available to them? Because asking for... Asking for that level of help, it's kind of if someone says, well, can I get a cheeseburger? Because they know they do cheeseburgers in that thing. <laughs> if somebody just walks up and goes, well, I don't, know, I don't know what it is that I want, and I don't know if you have it. Yeah, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Um, I reckon you're a, you're a one proper 10-minute conversation away from being super knowledgeable on mental health. But the problem is we don't want to have that 10-minute chat. So... If someone came up to me and asked me, and because of Man Up, I now get a lot of that. I had 14,000 letters wrote to me, which is High five. amazing. Um, 
That that's not even including emails or people on Messenger or people on Twitter. Physical, physical, physical right? someone physical put it in an envelope with a stamp, which is I don't know what it's like in Scotland, but it's old school now to use any post at all. The only time I get post is if it's a bill or a something. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was an, it was amazing, and that, that process is still happening at the moment, going through all those because they all need reading, they all need answering, they all need to be respectfully considered. So letters like, you know, this came too late for my father, this came too late for my husband, I wish I'd seen this program and sat down with my nephew who took his own life. So they're they're all full-on letters. There's no letters there going, you know, just talking about, you know, the weather and the sporting team you follow. These are full-on letters of two, three, four pages, some of them 20 pages explaining their life. Country life in Australia is a real problem at the moment because they can be the most brilliant farmer in the world and if it doesn't rain, they're fucked. Yeah. You know, or if it rains too much, they're fucked. Or if they, if it hails one night before they're about to take the crop in, they're fucked. The reality is they're fucked, their family's fucked, they're bankrupt, they don't have any skills which can transfer from... It's back you know, to the bank manager again to explain it. The bank manager understands, but he's got his own pressures and the farm's been in the family for 120 years. And so you've got legacy, you've got responsibility. Massive issues with that. And a lot of families want to have their kids educated well, so they send them to the big schools in the city. So they're boarding and it's all big money. So there's lots of debt building up and through no fault of their own. And they're a remote as well, incredibly remote, both emotionally and geographically. Well, we had a situation here in Oz where they put the Man Up show on the manup.org website. Well, half the people wrote to me and said, I can't get that. We don't have the bandwidth to be able to get the downloads because they live seven or eight hours away from anywhere else. They live in whoop, what we call whoop whoop in Australia. You just got telephones last week. Correct, <laughs> literally. Um, so, we need, so we're busily cutting off DVDs in the office of the Man Up TV show um, and send, sending them off to him. I go to Officeworks, our local stationery seat, and I'm buying a hundred DVDs at a time. I'm in my own pocket, don't care, but we do it. There's no funding for that. Like people go, oh, just suck it on the internet. Well, that will only work for ninety percent of the population, and the ten percent really need it out there in the country. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. The conversation needs to be had. Normally, the hardest thing is saying, "Mate, I've got a problem. I need to talk to you." The person listening has to go, okay, I haven't got the solutions, but I want to listen to you and we can work it out together. Because us men, we love to go, right, there's a nail, there's a hammer, fixed it, boom. My wife said to me the other day, she had some sort of issue. And as she's talking to me, I'm working out the solution in my head. Because I want to show her that I'm, I care and that I've got the solution and I'm the man in her life and I can deal with it. About halfway through, she's looking at me, you're not listening. I go, what do you mean? She goes, you're working out the solution. I don't need a solution. I need you to listen to me. I want to share. And I, all I need to do is share and I'll work it out myself. And, you know, it may not be a solution. It may just be that I've got to get off my chest. We've got to be really good listeners as well as good talkers. And that's n- not necessarily an easy thing to do when you're talking out of banterland. And when I talk banterland, I'm talking sport, weather, work. We can talk about that the cows come home. But talk about your own feelings, we shut up. The, the reality is that, you know, if we went down to Darwin Harbour, say, six hours from now, there'd be a bunch of guys and be a group of four, a group of Thursday night hours. in Sydney, yeah. And when they get home, their wives or their girlfriends say, oh, who'd you meet tonight? I met Stevie, I met Ben, I met Jim. Or oh, what did you talk about? Nothing. You know. Just, you know, we're just, we're just talking. Well, what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, nothing. Huh? Because we lost the game. Yeah, because reality is guys can go out and, as you say, it'll just be two guys maybe in the night and go, oh, listen, this thing. I mean, I've got friends and we talk and we are, you know, we are brutally honest. Yeah. And the night generally starts with verbal abuse because that's disarming. <laughs> and I'm talking real strong verbal abuse. And then after that point, you can just go, oh, listen, can I get your advice on something? But I think that my friends and I are perhaps minority. You, I've, I've, no doubt you are. No doubt you are. Like you walked in here, I haven't met you, and you walked in here and you are quite disarming anyway, just the way you are, you're a big general giant. It's so obviously that, you know, you're having a laugh and having a crack. It's the fact that I understand maybe two words of every ten that you say. <laughs> but I might be the same to you and your your podcast listeners. Lifeline may well be one of the it may well be one of the first times or the last times that, you know, people call that number. In the UK we have the Samaritans. Do you think we need to change the way that mental health and mental help it's publicised and marketed. Definitely. I had this argument actually with someone on telly last week because we had a 
quite a famous um, Wallaby second row. So the Australian rugby second row, Dan Vickerman, Big died man. of huge man. He was bigger than you. He's six foot eight, played at 120 kilos. Big, strong unit, never took a backward step. And he took his own life, leaving his wife and two kids. And he was about to talk at a uh, function, which is happening next week without him now, um, about sports people getting away from sport and back into the real world, out of their sporting bubble, and how difficult it is. And each sporting body aren't doing enough to sort of, you know, get them through that process. Guys and girls, all sports. Um and I said on the radio, he's suicide. And the bloke rang me up and said, mate, you can't say that. He said, we've got like a, we've got like a policy amongst people in the media. We don't talk about, it. we just say there was no, um, suspicious circumstances. And then we have the lifeline number or back in Scotland, you have the Samaritans number. I'm like, why don't we just say what it is? Like call a spade a spade. He goes, well, that could cause more suicide. I said, mate, the problem's gone from six people to eight people in the last year. Like, why do we keep doing the same thing? Expect to get a different result. The definition of madness is doing the same thing time and time again, expecting a different result. Yeah. Now I've been down staying at the Four Seasons, and I've been down there for. Ladi da, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I've never started at the Four Seasons. Oh, you can come down for dinner if you want. <laughs> yeah. But we were down there in the first day, and somebody threw themselves off the toaster building. Oh yeah. That was the first day. Uh, and for anyone that's been to Darling Harbour Circular, hey, sorry, for anyone that's been down to Circular Key, which is where this happened, it's a beautiful, beautiful one of the best spots in the world. You see the bridge, you see the opera house, it's absolutely stunning. We were down there on the first day and a guy killed himself. And I said to my cousin's husband, Mark, I said, oh, you know, was there, was there a state visit on today? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, we were down at, we were down at Circular Quay. I said, uh, there was hundreds of police everywhere and there was a big thing that was off, sorry, shaded off. I thought it must have been a state visit, and he said, yeah, he goes, hey, I don't know. And then somebody was in a mixed company said, no, a guy killed himself, but the media prohibited from broadcasting it. That's right. So we've got a, we've got a situation, and we're not talking about it, and we're not aware of it. And then I think that, I think that compounds it for the guy that's sitting at home thinking, well, the media can't talk about it. Yeah. And I don't know what your TV stations here are, the NBC, CBS. Well, exactly, the, well, exactly the same. But, you know, if, if, you know, if the guys at the top are saying we're not talking about that, what does that message send to the guy that's... Exactly. Let's talk about it. And let's, let's try that anyway. You know, because what's, what's going on at the moment is not working. So let's try, let's try something a little bit different. So that's my, that's my point of view. I mean, at the end of the Man Up show, there's a, a TV commercial we put together, which, I'm very happy to say it's had like 54 million views now. Like, got picked up by the Lad Bible over in your part of the world. Yep. And UK Mail picked it up and um, America picked it up. So 54 million people have seen this one-minute ad. And it's about man up, speak up, rather than man up, shut up. Because when you're told, certainly in Australia, to man up, it's like, you know, get yourself up, stop being a girl, you know, don't let your teammates down, you know, get, be stoic, fire up. It's like, that's actually killing us. I've had that barbecues before. Like, you know, not necessarily my family, but there was a kid and the kid was playing football and he was playing with his two brothers and his cousin and he missed the ball and he fell over and, he, you know, he sort of banged his head uh, and he cried and he came over with his mum because obviously he's emotional, he's upset, he doesn't quite know how to deal with it. He's got the hurt that his, his family will, like left him there in the ground, i.e. siblings, and then he goes over to his mum for some reassurance and she's going, oh, you'll be okay, normal. And then he... One of the males in the family, not even the, the dad, but one of the males in the family just said that that kid needs to man up. Yeah. And you're like, all right, so they shouldn't be expressing that they're hurt and they're not entirely sure what's going on in the world. Yeah. When, yeah. When a chicken exactly. Around, but everyone yeah. nods along, yeah, come on, mate. Yeah. So at some stage between the, like, you're a young child, like a baby, you scream, someone changes your nappy or feeds you or gives you comfort. At some time, sometimes between that, crying gives us something happy. And then somewhere through primary school, crying, you start getting vilified and people giving it to you and people upsetting you. So no wonder by the time you're 10 or 12, you go, well, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to show my emotion. I did a thing the other day with some kindergarten kids. And I said, how do you show emotion? I said, when you're happy, what do you do? And they went, we scream, we, you know, big smiles, we cheer and stuff. I said, what about when you're sad? Oh, oh no, we don't do that. Put the mask on, spend a bit of time by yourself. Sort yourself out. These are five, six-year-olds already being sort of stereotyped and conditioned to being that type of person. It's a, absolutely, it's, it was so sad driving away from that interview I did with those little kids. 
it's funny, my nephew and I, who's a, you know, 16 now and we're incredibly close, and we'll watch a film and no matter what the film is, we'll turn around at the end of each other and go, are, are you crying yet? Yeah. Which is a joke for us because it'll be like, you know, at the end of the Karate Kid, at the end of like, you know, Terminator, and it's just this joke and go, are you crying yet? And then he'll go, I'm crying inside. <laughs> Which I realise is funny for him and I, but the idea that if say I was to go and watch The Notebook, would I, would I feel comfortable crying for <laughs> my nephew? I'm going to say 50-50. But why is it that we can't fully express ourselves? Yeah. Like, admit that we have well, a weakness, or... Because we have a stereotype saying that that's not the right thing to do. Which right. may, and it's, and it's, a, and it's, a, it's a trained condition, which means that we can train ourselves the other way around as well. If you could speak to anyone that's struggling right now, anyone, any one of the listeners that is having difficulty and not too sure how they're going to navigate a problem they might be having, what advice would you give them? Now, there's a couple of different ways to look at this. The, the most important thing is you need to talk. You need to talk to someone. So if you don't feel comfortable talking to your family or your friends, that's fine because there's heaps of other people out there. You said the Samaritans are similar to our lifeline here. So the Samaritans, give them a call and just tell them because it's a stranger. The more you tell people, the more likely you are to get it fixed. I can guarantee you if you keep it to yourself, you're going to either end up not well or you're going to end up having a life that's actually not that fun because you're continually shoving down this toxic stuff. So just share your issues because it may not be as big a deal as you think. Every, every issue I have in life now, I share. And maybe I'm an oversharer, but at least my mates know where I'm coming from. And they take the piss out of me at times. But they also know when they look at me in the eye and it's something that's really important, they also know that, okay, time to knuckle down and let's help each other through this issue. And if you share it with someone, then they're more likely to share something with you. So your problem might be helping them out as well. Well, I think there's that thing when there's a mutual honesty and there's a mutual respect. Or it's like, well, if I open myself completely up to you and say, um, and, you know, I'm really vulnerable when I need help, it makes it, I think, easier for them well, to do the same. It also sorts out your good mates from your friends. Like, I reckon a whole lot of people in Australia have a whole heap of mates. But how many friends that they got, you know? And I reckon between a mate and a friend, they can be the same person, but it's the one that you can talk about really important things with every now and again. It's not like every time you're at the pub, oh, mate, I'm so glad to hear <laughs> bursting into tears. No one wants that. But if you have to go through that for a period of time to come out the other side, then a friend will totally accept that, you know what, I'm knuckling down, I'm helping my mate out. It's not going to last forever, but he's going to be around. I'm not going to be sitting there looking at his bloody coffin. I've been at that many suicides and people go, I had no idea that he wasn't well. Why didn't he talk to me? You know, he actually seemed really happy the last time I was. If I hear that comment one more time, you know, because you can't pick people a lot. Certainly in Australia, they wear such an unbelievable mask. They're not sitting there teary and showing emotion. They've got the bloody armour on, yeah. you know. So they are looking as if life is totally in control. But it's part of the screwing identity. It's really, yeah. it's really strong. And I think it's worthwhile, you know, life is pain, life is adversity, life is going through a lot of hard stuff. Whether that's working out how to change a nappy the first time, that's pretty <laughs> difficult. Whether it's dealing the first time that, you know, your son or your daughter breaks something, whether it be a bone or a heart. Yeah. Uh, whether it be the first time you have news of a death from a family or whatever, you miss, you miss a job promotion you're trying to get. It's pain and it's adversity. That's the nature of life. Yeah. So I think people realise that not only are they going through it, but everyone else thinks, you know, we can change it. And everyone's a bit different too. There's a lot of people out there that can, that can be stoic and can hold on to stuff and they'll always be okay. That's fine. Good on you. I'm really glad for you. But there's a whole heap of us that can't. So can you be there for us when, when we do need you? You know, and be, be kind. Be a good person, you know. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. It's a dick. Can we have life with a no dickhead policy? Absolutely. I don't know what it's like in Scotland. We've got plenty of dickheads here. Will they get knocked out? Um, we'll get knocked <laughs> yeah. out. Uh, anything, any final thoughts you would like to share? Oh, well, thank you? you for showing your inter interest. And I hope that, I mean, you're the perfect person from what I've gathered in our chat to do a man up type show in Scotland. That's what you should be going for. Because the more people doing shows like that, big burly blokes who, you know, most people would look at and go, well, he's got life under control. If you're showing emotion and you go out there and show the Scottish people that we can change the way it is to be a Scottish man, God, that's what we need. We need a man up in every country because sometimes someone might watch my show and go, well, that's in Australia. 
that's not going to affect me here in Scotland or in England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, America, wherever. Everyone's got to have their own manner because I think we've got a massive issue. Um, I know the suicide rates around the world are through the roof. So, um, you know, let's have conversations and let's be honest with each other. And, you know, it's actually really brave to show vulnerability. Yep. So I'd like to thank Gus for not only agreeing to see me because I know he's a busy man, I'd also like to say thank you for making the show. I think it's a you know it's a wonderful end to the show. So whatever you're doing the rest of your day, like seriously, if you're gonna go on Facebook, close the window down, if you're gonna go on Instagram, post another photo of yourself, well first of all have a word to yourself. <laughs> go and watch the programme, learn something and realise that as Gus said, although you may well be stoic, although you may well be strong and you don't need help, I bet there's somebody in your life that needs to have a chat. So learn learn the dynamic, learn to have that conversation, be open. And, you know, today you may well save a life, today you may well help someone, or you may well just improve the quality of a life. Just imagine for a moment if you are that guy that's the strongest guy in the room, and you've always been the strongest guy in the room, the best look in the sport. Imagine if you're that guy who walks over to someone and says, I'm here for you, I love you no matter what. You imagine how much good you can do? And imagine if that if you're that person actually needs some help and you take the cape off for one minute and ask one of your friends and say, look, I haven't got it all under control here. That relationship that you have with that person for the rest of your life will be the greatest thing you've ever done and you'll save your life and maybe someone else's. Cool. Gus, thanks for coming. Thanks, buddy. Show. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy your time in Australia. Smashing. Thanks for joining me in the show today. I hope that you enjoyed the show. It's a serious subject matter and it's a hard conversation to have but it's one that we should be having more often. So if you've got a mate or a friend that you think might be down, ask them how they're getting on. And if you're someone that's feeling down, call a friend and tell them how you feel. It's nothing to be ashamed of. We all go through it. So reach out and have that chat. It might not be fixed immediately, but you will feel better once you share it. And if you've enjoyed today's show, there's plenty more to choose from. So if you have the time, please write a review in the iTunes store. And whatever you're up to this weekend, have fun, be safe, hug a stranger, express yourself and remember to smile. But for now, everyone at Stephen Rowan Show, catch you later.